The Ways We Lie by Stephanie Erickson The bank called today, and I told them my deposit was in the mail. Even though I hadn't written a check yet, it'd been a rough day. The baby I'm pregnant with decided to do aerobics on my lungs for two hours. Our three-year-old daughter painted the living room couch with lipstick. The IRS put me on hold for an hour, and I was late to a business meeting because I was tired. I told my client the traffic had been bad. When my partner came home, his haggard face told me his day hadn't gone any better than mine. So when he asked, how was your day? I said, oh, fine, knowing that one more straw might break his back. A friend called and wanted to take me to lunch. I said I was busy. Four lies in the course of a day, none of which I felt the least bit guilty about. We lie. We all do. We exaggerate. We minimize. We avoid confrontation. We spare people's feelings. We conveniently forget we keep secrets. We justify lying to the big guy institutions. Like most people, I indulge in small falsehoods and still think of myself as an honest person. Sure, I lie, but it doesn't hurt anything, or does it? I once tried going a whole week without telling a lie, and it was paralyzing. I discovered that telling the truth all the time is nearly impossible. It means living with some serious consequences. The bank charges me $60 in overdraft fees. My partner keels over when I tell him about my travails. My client fires me for telling her I didn't feel like being on time. And my friend takes it personally when I say I'm not hungry. There must be some merit to lying. But if I justify lying, what makes me any different from slick politicians or the corporate robbers who raided the SNL industry? Saying it's okay to lie one way and not another is hedging. I cannot seem to escape the voice deep inside me that tells me when someone lies, someone loses. What far-reaching consequences will I or others pay as a result of my lie? Will someone's trust be destroyed? Will someone else pay my penance because I ducked out? We must consider the meaning of our actions, deception, lies, capital crimes, and misdemeanors all carry meanings. Webster's def definition of lie is specific. A false statement or action, especially made with the intent to deceive. Anything that gives or is meant to give a false impression. A definition like this implies that there are many, many ways to tell a lie. Here are just a few. The white lie. A man who won't lie to a woman has very little consideration for her feelings. Virgin Evans. The white lie assumes that the truth will cause more damage than a simple, harmless untruth. Telling a friend he looks great when he looks like hell can be based on a decision that the friend needs a compliment more than a frank opinion. But in effect, it is the liar deciding what is best for the lied to. Ultimately, is a, it is a vote of no confidence. It is an act of subtle arrogance for anyone to decide what is best for someone else. Yet not all circumstances are quite so cut and dried. Take, for instance, the sergeant in Vietnam who knew one of his men was killed in action, but listed him as missing so that the man's family would receive indefinite compensation instead of the lump sum Penance, the military gives widows and children. His intent was honorable, yet for twenty years this family kept their hopes alive, unable to move on to a new life. Facades, et tu, Brute, Caesar. We all put up facades to one degree or another. When I put on a suit to go see a client, I feel as though I am putting on another face, obeying the expectation that serious business people wear suits 
rather than sweatpants. But I'm a writer. Normally, I get up, get the kid off to school, and sit at my computer in my pajamas until 4 in the afternoon. When I answer the phone, the caller thinks I'm wearing a suit, though the UPS man knows better. But facades can be destructive because they are used to seduce others into an illusion. For instance, I recently realized that a former friend was a liar. He presented himself with all the right looks and the right words and offered lots of new consciousness theories, fabulous books to read, and fascinating insights. Then I did some business with him, and the time came for him to pay me. He turned out to be all talk and no walk. I heard a plethora of reasonable excuses, including in-depth descriptions of the big break around the corner. In six months of work, I saw less than a hundred bucks. When I confronted him, he raised both eyebrows and tried to convince me that I'd heard him wrong, that he'd made no commitment to me. A simple investigation into his past revealed a crowded graveyard of disenchanted former friends. Ignoring the plain facts. Well, you must understand that Father Porter is only human, a Massachusetts priest. In the 60s, the Catholic Church in Massachusetts began hearing complaints that Father James Porter was sexually molesting children. Rather than relieving him of his duties, the ecclesiastical authorities simply moved him from one parish to another between 1960 and 1967, actually providing him with a fresh supply of unsuspecting families and innocent children to abuse. After treatment in 1967 for pedophilia, he went back to work this time in Minnesota. The new diocese was aware of Father Porter's obsession with children, but they needed priests and recklessly believed treatment had cured him. More children were abused until he was relieved of his duties a year later. By his own admission, Porter may have abused as many as a hundred children. Ignoring the facts may not in and of itself be a form of lying, but consider the context of this situation. If a lie is a false action done with the intent to deceive, then the Catholic Church's conscious covering of, for Porter created irreparable consequences. The Church became a co-perpetrator with Porter deflecting. When you have no basis for an argument, abuse the plaintiff, Cicero. I've discovered that I can keep anyone from seeing the true me by being selectively blatant. I set a precedent of being upfront about intimate issues, but I never bring up the things I truly want to hide. I just let people assume I'm revealing everything. It's an effective way of hiding. Any good liar knows that the way to perpetrate an untruth is to deflect attention from it. When Clarence Thomas exploded with accusations that the Senate hearings were a high-tech lynching, he simply switched the focus from a highly charged subject to a radioactive subject. Rather than defending himself, he took the offensive and accused the country of racism. It was a brilliant maneuver. Racism is now politically incorrect in official circles, unlike sexual harassment, which still rewards those who can get away with it. Some of the most skilled Deflectors are passive-aggressive people who, when accused of inappropriate behavior, refuse to respond to the accusations. This you-don't-exist stance infuriates the accuser who, understandably, screams something obscene out of frustration. The trap is sprung and the act of deflection successful because now the passive-aggressive person can indignantly say, 
who can talk to someone as unreasonable as you? The real issue is forgotten, and the sins of the original victim become the focus. Feeling guilty of name-calling, the victim is fully tamed and crawls into a hole ashamed. I have watched this fighting technique work thousands of times in disputes between men and women, and what I've learned is that the real culprit is not necessarily the one who swears the loudest. Omission. The cruelest lies are often told in silence. R. L. Stevenson. Omission involves telling most of the truth minus one or two key facts whose absence changes the story completely. You break a pair of glasses that are guaranteed under normal use and get a new pair without mentioning that the first pair broke during a rowdy game of basketball. Who hasn't tried something like that? But what about omission of information that could make a difference in how a person lives his or her life? For instance, one day I found out that rabbinical legends tell of another woman in the Garden of Eden before Eve. I was stunned. The omission of the Sumerian goddess Lilith from Genesis, as well as her demonization by ancient misogynists as an embodiment of female evil, felt like spiritual robbery. I felt like I just found out my mother was really my stepmother. To take seriously the tradition that Adam was created out of the same mud as his equal counterpart Lilith redefines all Judeo-Christian history. Some renegade Catholic feminists introduced me to a view of Lilith that had been suppressed during the many centuries when the strong goddess was seen only as a spirit of evil. Lilith was a proud goddess who defied Adam's need to control her, attempted negotiations, and when this failed, said adios and left the Garden of Eden. This omission of Lilith from the Bible was a patriarchal strategy to keep women weak. Omitting the strong woman's archetype of Lilith from Western religions and starting the story with Eve, the rib, has helped keep Christian and Jewish women believing they were the lesser sex for a thousand for thousands of years.